Good. Good. No, just... No, just... just okay, fine. Don't need to... Okay. Um, we've... Uh, uh, we're going to start again with the uh, second in the series of super oscillations. I, you all know yeah. Sir Michael Berry, so I'm just going to let him go. If you have a question, though, um, please hit speak on your thing and speak into the microphone and then turn it off like this. Good. Right. Well, today I want to start by explaining how I knew about super oscillations before I realized I knew about them how I knew about them in the 1970s before I started studying them in the 1990s. It wasn't until the 2000s that uh, my slow brain with its two separate parts made the connection. So, uh, I, let, let me be a little bit personal. I, I'm largely self-constructed as a scientist. I, I never really worked with a, with a senior person for a long time. My, my supervisor, Bob Dingle, is somebody I hugely admire, and you'll hear about this at lunchtime on Thursday. That's, but we never worked together. He gave me a problem that, or suggested a problem which I liked, but which, which he hoped would yield to his mathematical methods, and it didn't. And he was very good to me, but we didn't work together. So I came to Bristol, and there were these very senior people around. But it wasn't until the 1970s, 1973, 4, that I started working with John Nye. Now, John Nye, who's now 90, uh, 94, was then a very senior scientist. And he was famous, and still is famous, as one of the world's leading glaciologists. And he consulted me about a problem. Um, he knew I was interested in waves. And in fact, I seduced him into being interested in waves from then till now. But, and the problem was this. He, he was studying the ice in Antarctica. That's 10% of the Earth's surface covered with ice. That means that... Uh, it was a problem to map the surface of the Earth beneath the ice. And to do that, people were using radio echo sounding. You fly over with a plane, and you send a pulse, and you time when it comes back. And that tells you a pulse of radio waves that penetrate through ice, which five meter waves do. And then you can uh, guess, see where the, where, the ice, where the bed is. But what Nye pointed out to me is that as well as this reflection coming back, there are many later disorderly echoes coming back from the roughness of the surface, not immediately below. And what could we say about that? And then, so we talked and started thinking. And then he made a laboratory analog. Instead of radio waves, he had uh, ultrasound waves of a millimeter or so wavelength. Instead of Antarctica's bottom, he had uh, crinkly kitchen foil. Okay. And it was an undergraduate experiment. And then you could, with the acoustics, you could actually see the echo as it came back as a function of time. And he saw something peculiar in the echo that came back. And we talked about it, realized that something strange was happening in the wave uh, that came back. And we realized that it had in it what we now call an optical vortex. OK. Now, we, um, we wrote a paper dislocations. I'll explain where that comes from in a moment, in 1974. And uh, I was speaking about it here and there, and uh, people liked it, but didn't really take much notice of it, weren't much influenced by it. And uh, I wrote a review a, a few years uh, later. Now, let me tell you what this is about. <laughs> Consider a wave satisfying the wave equation, the time-dependent wave equation. There it is. Let, let me uh, make this... Uh, a little bit bigger. Just a second. I'll, I'll, I'll magnify the pointer. So let me do that first of all. I forgot to do it. There. That's better. Good. OK, so we have the, the wave equation. There it is. And um, here's a particular exact solution. It's like a plane wave uh, traveling upwards. But it isn't monochromatic, because it's uh, x plus i times uh, something, uh, depending on time. It's a rigidly, wave rigidly moving upwards. So here it is, and I've color-coded the phase by color, by hue. So red, let's say, are the crests, and uh, blue-green are the troughs, and you see the structure. And uh, that's this wave. It's a complex wave, traveling wave. And it has in it a phase singularity now called optical vortices, with reasons that would be clear. Um, 
It has other structure too. It has a saddle point of phase there. You'll see it more clearly in a moment. So interesting topological structure in this wave. Um, there's a wavelength. So this structure we're on scales less than a wavelength in this wave. Um, now this, this structure is like an extra half plane of wavefront, which reminded John Nye, who knew all about uh, dislocations in solid state physics, as a it reminded him of edge dislocations in crystals. You've got planes of atoms, and you slide in extra half plane. The edge of that is an edge dislocation. And uh, because we found many, many exact solutions with morphologies like edge dislocations, screw dislocation, mixed edge screw interacting between them, and all kinds of things, that uh, we called these things wavefront dislocations in our first paper. But uh, there are also phase singularities, there are also optical vortices, there are also nodes. Now this is a point in two dimensions, because the only way a phase of a smooth function can be indefinite is if the strength of the function, the amplitude of it, is zero. So these are also nodes, lines in three dimensions. Why? Because you want the real part to vanish, imaginary part to vanish, that's co-dimension two, points in the plane, lines in, two, in, in three dimensions. So here's a more detailed picture where um, this is half a wavelength, this is a pyth of a wavelength, and you see the uh, phase singularity, these dashed lines, sorry, these vec arrows are the gradient lines, so they're perpendicular to the phase lines, and because they go round and round, that's why these things are called optical vortices, there's a detailed analogy uh, uh, between fluid vortices and optical vortices, which I won't go into. Um, and so there it is, that's the singularity, and there's a saddle point there, you can see it. Good. So, uh, either in the original paper or in the, a couple of years later, I made this comment that uh, this shows that dislocations are the most delicate features of waves in the sense that they exhibit interesting phase topology on scales much smaller than a wavelength. And you can see where this is going towards super oscillations, but we'll get there gently. Um, so here they are, wave vortices, phase singularities, nodal points and lines, wave dislocations, all the same thing. Okay. Um, not much um, interest for a number of years until there was a, the idea was picked up, our paper was picked up by Yakov Zeldovich, and he wrote something about statistics uh, of these structures, which I had also done uh, about the same time. And this was picked up by experimentalists in around 1990 in Ukraine, Marat Soskin. And this started a huge body of work, which is continuing now, where um, this uh, idea is exploited. Now, I, I want to make a, a comment. No, I won't make it just yet. I'll make it in a little while. Just wait, wait for me. Um, but, so I started working again on, on, on this subject because uh, experimentalists had uh, uh, become interested, and that always gives a different perspective. And you first start by being impatient. They don't understand the theoretical concepts properly, but then you end up realizing that what they do actually leads you in new directions. And I was fortunate enough to have uh, a student, Mark Nennis, starting in 1998, with me, and he's continued working on these things with me and separately uh, since then. Um, l let me continue a little. L let's look at classical or quantum waves in the plane now satisfying the time-independent wave equation. These now are static structures, monochromatic structures. And the solutions are superpositions of plane waves all of which have wave vectors with the same length, wavelength 2 pi over k0, but different directions. So all waves in the plane, satisfy of Helmholtz, are of this type. But as I have said already last time, the local gradient of phase, which you can call the local wave vector, and I gave a number of interpretations of that the other day, can exceed the wave the length of the wave vector of all the, any of the plane waves making up the superposition, and of course these are super oscillations. And this k is, local k is parallel to the local uh, energy flow or pointing vector or current if it's quantum mechanics. Okay. And uh, around this time, uh, in the 2000s, a very talented experimenter, Miles Paget, said, 
I don't understand these optical vortices. I don't believe that you could really have a zero there, he said, because if you really had a zero, then the phase would change by two pi as you go around, because it's a single-valued function, and that would mean that very, very, at a circle very, very close, the phase would be changing much more rapidly than the wavelength, and that's impossible. And then click, I realized, of course, these are super oscillations. It's what I'd been studying separately for um, uh, uh, more than a decade. And uh, that connection was then firmly made, cemented. I hadn't realized that I'd been studying super oscillations since 1974. And I wrote a few papers about it. Let me show you one exact solution. This is an angular momentum eigenstate of the Helmholtz equation e to the i m phi, there's an origin, and you have the Bessel function j m, smooth function. And uh, here's a color-coded plot of the phase, it's here, um, for m equals 10. You go around, you see 10 reds, 10 blues, 10 greens, is the phase. Um, and as I've just said, around the vortex core, the phase can vary very rapidly. And the local gradient of phase, I already showed it last time, is inversely proportional to the distance. It has to be in order to change by 2 pi as you go round the phase. And so uh, you can have these phase contours, uh, current contours, energy flow contours, integral curves of the k vector. And super oscillations are whenever the radius, and whenever you're closer to the origin than, roughly speaking, m wavelengths. Very good. Um, to create a nice super oscillatory function of one variable, imagine flying by this vortex at a distance y from it, and looking then as a function of x. So here it is, it's e to the i, um, arc tan y over x, that's the angle phi. Very good. Um, just to make a comment, which I'll enlarge on for a moment. Uh, this function is not normalizable, the square integral of it is zero. Now this is relevant because there are a number of papers where people speak about such things as super oscillation yield, want to quantify how big the super oscillation is, and they do this in terms of uh, taking, comparing the scale of the super oscillations in some way with the right dimensions with the square integral of the function. You can't do that uh, uh, with this, but you can actually, if you take the imaginary part and square it, or if you take the derivative with respect to y and square it, um, then these are normalizable, and I'll show you in a moment. Um, but the super oscillations, as I'll also show you, look much the same, actually. So this business of normalization is completely irrelevant to the strength of super oscillation. It's, uh, I think, a mistaken direction that people make. Okay, so super oscillation, a local thing, it doesn't matter whether the thing converges far away or not. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. We'll get back to that. But let's look at this flyby more carefully. Here's the logarithm of the real part. It should be actually the modulus of the real part. Now, here is it oscillating very fast, and here it's oscillating, as you would expect, two zeros of the real part, logarithm minus infinity, per wave length. Zooming in, here are the super oscillations. Um, very good. And there, as repeatedly will appear, and has already appeared, they're exponentially weak. Um, I want to talk about this normalization. Here's the uh, local structure, logarithm of the real part. Here's logarithm of the imaginary part. I've shifted it up so you can see it separately. Logarithm of the real part of the derivative with respect to y. Here it is again. So these are all more or less the same. The super oscillations are not much different. But now let's look at the big scale. Let's look at the function it, the square of these functions themselves, and you'll see that they're very, very different. This one, the real part, is, um, is uh, not normalizable. It's decaying too slowly. This imaginary part, the red, is normalizable, and so is the uh, de derivative. Um, so just to illustrate that the, what happens far away can be very different, but that is irrelevant to the super oscillations in the regions uh, where that occurs. Now I want to perturb this vortex a little bit. Perturb it with a little bit of J0, epsilon's worth. OK. Now, the vortex at the center, this T 
tenth order vortex is unstable. Almost anything you do will split it into the generic vortices of order one, ten of them. This is ten to the minus seven's worth of this uh, perturbation. You see it split a substantial fraction of the wavelength, but still within a wavelength. The separation of vortices is uh, epsilon to the, uh, to the one over m times the wavelength, so it's a small fraction. Um, okay. Um, Here's the local wave vector directions, an interesting pattern, but again, the vortices, vortex structure surrounding the, um, each of the singularities. And I've dashed line very faint beneath, you can see it there, these are the phase contours, which spread out like uh, hedgehogs from, uh, from, from, from the singularity. Okay, so this is a class of super oscillations. But for this perturbed case, the intensity as well as the phase is varying on sub-wavelength scales. And here's a graph of the intensity. So uh, lots of structures you can create with perfectly normal, much-studied waves if you look at them in this uh, uh, slightly different way. And as I have again said, not paradoxical, because in the super oscillatory region, the wave is exponentially small in the number of super oscillations, delta being the spacing between them, divided by the wavelength to some to this high power. Good. Now, ah, okay. Now I want to tell you about history. The point of our paper in 1974 was to introduce these phase singularities as general features of all kinds of waves. Now, physicists already knew about quantized vortices in the wave functions in superconductors in super quantized flux lines, excuse me, quantized vortices in superfluids. So there were anticipations in what, from an everyday point of view, it rather exotic physics. But what we were pointing out is that these are absolutely generic features. As I'm speaking to you now, the sound waves in this room are threaded with a forest of, uh, opt of acoustic vortex lines moving past your ears too fast for you not to hear them. Zeros. Okay. Actually, they can move faster than sound, or op optical ones can move faster than light. You can quite easily find solutions of the wave equation, relativistic wave equation, where they do that. And it's not paradoxical because you can't use them to send information. They're forms and not things. Okay. So anyway, this was the point of our paper, to emphasize a generality. But we were very interested to discover how far back the concept went. And I want to spend some time on that because it's, it, it, there's some very interesting history uh, involved. The first person known to us who conceived phase singularities was William Hewell, one of these impossible to pronounce English names, uh, in the tides. You see, um, Thomas Young, when he was formulating wave physics in the way we begin to understand it now, uh, realized that the tides are a wave of 12-hour period driven by the moon across the Earth, the Earth's water. Now, Newton and Laplace and others had understood pretty well what would happen to the tides on a perfectly smooth Earth with no land, just water covered. But Thomas Young said, that, well, there are all kinds of interferences because you've got land, the tide comes this way and it comes that way and you get interference. And, and he said, a way to study this would be if somebody would only measure, determine, the co-tidal lines. Now, uh, um, he defined, these are what we would call the wave fronts of the tide wave. So the co-tidal lines are this. You take one instant now, and you plot on the surface of the water all the points on which the tide is high. And of course, that includes the land, where the edge of the coast, where people see a high tide. Then one hour later, you plot the different curve, and an hour later, an hour. these are the co-tidal lines, wave fronts of the tide wave. And he said, it would be interesting if uh, somebody could determine these. 30 years later, William Hewell did. Now, this is not easy. I think it was the first large-scale international scientific collaboration. He had coast guards and sea captains uh, all around what was then called the German Ocean between now it's the North Sea between uh, England and the continent of Europe, um, to record their observations. Now, there were lots of measurements of the tides before, 
but they were unreliable because people didn't distinguish between the height of the tide and the flow of the tide, which happens halfway between flood tide. So he gave a very precise, this is what you do, this is what you measure. Britain being very powerful, England being very powerful at that time, all these people obeyed. And, uh, you know, really hundreds of people. It was a very substantial thing. And uh, he then was able to make a map of the co-tidal lines. And, of course, you see two phase singularities. He realized that... Uh, you had these uh, places where the tide is zero, but where all the co-tidal lines come together. He had a topological argument why this must occur. High tide goes down one place, up the other, and you, you, you can't avoid uh, it. Um, modern maps of this little part just here are almost identical to Huell's map from 1830-something. He called them amphidromic points. It means running around, the co-tidal running around like the spokes of a wheel points of no tide. Now it took a very long time for this idea to be accepted because somebody who was a much better mathematician than Huell, namely George Airy, the astronomer royal, we've heard his name before and we'll hear it again in, in these talks, um, couldn't understand this notion. He had a very in, slightly incoherent picture of what might happen and it didn't make any sense at all to a modern eye, which was published in the Encyclopedia Metropolitana and it was decades before oceanographers independently realized that uh, these co-tidal lines exist, the amphidromic points, exist. they're now central to modern oceanography. Um, Huell um, is not well known for this. It's a fantastic piece of science, what he did. But it's, he's not well known for it. He's much better known as a philosopher and a linguist and a Greek and Latin scholar. And uh, he coined the word physicist. He coined the word scientist. These words were criticized. Physicist was criticized because Faraday said nobody could pronounce it. It has four sibilant consonants that fizz like a squib. And scientists had Latin and Greek mixed up, and somebody wrote, better die for want of a term than bestialize our tongue with such a barbarism. Still, we use those terms now. I want to show you a modern world map showing you how widespread these amphidromic points are. It's a central concept in modern oceanography. You see, every, all the oceans have these phase singularities, and they're a kind of skeleton of the tides. But just to be very precise, there are a lot of different periodicities involved in the tides. Of course, you've got the moon, you've got the sun, you've got all kinds of in interactions between them. So the tide have a number of Fourier components. This is the main one. It's called the M2 tide. The other ones are fainter, but what that means, actually, is that these points very slowly move around. But this is the essence of the matter. Okay, so that's where the phase singularities first came in, this concept that much later we realized is completely ge generic, pervading waves of all kinds. But uh, I want to tell you how Newton almost discovered them. Okay? Now, Newton, as you know, never really grasped, never accepted, never understood the wave nature of light. He thought light was particles moving along rays. But he was deeply puzzled by experiments on diffraction, in particular Grimaldi's experiment from uh, about the time when Newton was starting out in, uh, in science in the 1660s, edge diffraction, diffraction by an edge, and you have little fringes. He couldn't understand them. So um, this is Grimaldi. Now, Newton was very careful, and he only wrote things he was really confident in, except much later in his life, in the second edition of his optics, there's a chapter in which he allows himself to speculate. And he speculates about how, in, wave, in ray physics, geometrical optics, these oscillations might occur. And there's a famous sentence, a couple of sentences, which have often been quoted in a sort of uncomplimentary way. This, he thought that the edges would exert forces on the waves. Are not the rays of light, in passing by the edges and sides of bodies, bent several times backwards and forwards with a motion like that of an eel, he wrote. And do not the three fringes of coloured light above mentioned arise from three such bendings? Now, when I read that, it really gave me a, a shock because uh, he's right, and he's very cleverly right. After 300 years, 
we could see those eels. Now, what had to happen? First of all, you had to have Maxwell's electromagnetism. Then you had to have, in 1896, Sommerfeld's exact solution for diffraction of a wave by a half plane. And uh, uh, here's the intensity. And uh, the incident light comes in. Here's the half plane. And uh, here's the phase. And uh, you see these singularities here. There are three phase singularities. Um, here are the diffracted waves. But then you had to have a plot of the lines of the pointing vector, the integral curves of this local wave vector. And that was done by Brownbeck and Laukian in uh, the 1950s. So it took a long 300 years, as I said. And now you see Newton's eels. This is Moripan. Now you really see these eels of Newton. So what Newton realized, uh, we, we, in a modern terminology, if you take the closest concepts in wave optics to the rays of geometrical optics, they do exactly what Newton had guessed. But what he didn't think, didn't realize, and that's why he failed to find phase singularities, is that sometimes these could curve so much they could curve up on themselves into vortices, and there are three of them there. So he didn't quite get there. However, this way of thinking was brought into quantum mechanics by Madelung in 1926, called the hydrodynamic interpretation. You can think of a fluid representing a wave function moving, and it was rediscovered by, um, uh, re re rediscovered by Bohm and de Broglie, this formulation. But they introduced what, to my mind, are useless words like real. And philosophers are greatly interested in their way of thinking. But essentially, this, the germ of this idea goes back to Newton. It's really an amazing, wonderful thing that uh, uh, he allowed himself to speculate. And, and uh, by the way, forces from edges and sides of the body, this is the quantum force that makes these lines curve. That is this uh, Laplacian of the, uh, Lapl Laplacian of the, um, uh, of the, of the intensity, which, uh, uh, which um, of course, ultimately arises from any obstacles and, and changes of variation of the Hamiltonian. Uh, that are there. So Newton was right. There is a force. It has this effect. Um, but he didn't foresee phase singularities. And indeed, one of my impatiences with the Bohmians is that uh, they didn't have enough confidence in their own picture to draw attention to the most important features of the picture that they were conceived gives rise to, namely the singularities, the optical vortices. They do now, but they, they, they didn't for years and years and years. But anyway, a bit of history that I thought, um, that I thought uh, might uh, be of interest. OK. Yes, the solution of the wave equation was the right? Yeah, exact solution. It's, a, it's a Fresnel integrals of a certain. But you mentioned the half plane. Yeah, the ha infinite half plane. That's the edge of it. See, there it, here it is. That's a half plane. It goes on down forever. No, 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 this is a half plane. It's just if wave come, waves come in, instant light. Let me go back a little bit. Yeah, wave comes in. You can look at the intensity, you can look at the phase, you can look at the gradient of phase. And um, you get this structure. I mean, you can think of it, uh, if you do asymptotics of the relevant integral that this describes this, you can realize where this structure comes from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, well, it's a, in, independent of the other direction. Yeah, it's, exa it's a famous exact solution. It's what Zorfer made him instantly famous. It was the first thing he did. It's, and by the way, the techniques he used were absolutely miraculous. I won't go into it now. but um, You can think of this as the interference of three waves. The direct wave, the reflected wave, and a wave scattered from the edge, an edge, one of Thomas Young's edge waves. When you do the asymptotics of the integral representation, different parts of the integral give rise to these different contributions, stationary phase points and, and the edge, edge um, asymptotic, end point asymptotics. So you can anatomize this uh, um, pattern into the three contributions which have different physical natures. But you needn't do that. You can just write the solution and you can just plot, the, plot it and you'll see these structures. Anyway, that was Newton. And as I say, anticipating uh, Bohm de Broglie and uh, what I prefer, Madelung. Okay. So does the picture look if you go down? 
Well, there'd be, there'd be a few more. Not many, not a finite number. A finite number, I'll tell you why. A finite number, because these edge waves are too weak after a while. So then, then, then you essentially get sort of inter two-wave interference far down, the incident and, and the reflected. Yeah. Um, but anyway, you see Newton's eels bend, bending, 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 as he guessed. OK. Now I want to do tell you something different. Since we're talking about vortices, I want to tell you about a rather dramatic, I think, dramatic prediction associated with uh, a vortex, a quantum prediction. And you'll see we're moving towards weak values and weak measurements. We'll uh, get to that slowly, and there'll be much more of it uh, tomorrow. So this has ended up at a paper I wrote with Steve Barnett uh, a couple of years ago. OK. So here's the point. You've got this local wave vector, multiplied by h bar, it's a local momentum. It should have some physical effect. Well, it's a wave, it's light. So put an atom there, or a small particle, say an atom, and uh, this atom doesn't see the wave anywhere else. It sees the waves where it is, and in particular, it sees this momentum. So I had the idea that this momentum, quantum mechanically considered now, would give this atom kicks. And they'd be very large kicks, because near a vortex, the length of this k vector can be arbitrarily large, much larger than any of the momenta in the plane waves comprising the structure. So imagine these will be individual photon impacts. That was the idea. So here's the picture. I've got a, I've got, um, a, a, ra a random wave with uh, a few vortices. There they are. And here are the lines of the, um, the, lines of the uh, uh, local momentum. And I want to contrast this with the current. I've spoken about this before. The current is the imaginary part of psi star grad psi, which is this wave vector, but it's weighted by this low probability of actually detecting such a photon. There really aren't many photons near there because the intensity goes to zero. So the idea came that this, on the average, is radiation pressure. That's what this is, classically becoming very small when you're far away. For a plane wave, it's what you're familiar with. Um, so the idea is that if this K really does represent um, momentum transfer to the atom, then what it tells you is something rather remarkable, that near to a vortex, this classical radiation pressure, which is the average, deconstructs quantum mechanically into extremely large, extremely rare kicks. OK. That was a heuristic idea. But then, uh, with Steve Barnett, we turned it into quantum mechanics. Um, imagine the atom is a two-level system. Right. It has a ground state with some energy, EG, excited state with energy, EE. And uh, the coupling, I don't want to go into it, this is apparently standard quantum optics, with electric dipole operator, some dipole strength, times this uh, product of the two states. It's a dipole operator. And you, there are standard techniques for doing calculations of this kind, a rotating wave approximation, simplify things by assuming it on resonance, so the frequency of the wave is the difference between these two energy levels. And then there's this rotating wave Hamiltonian. Never mind what it is. But this E of R is the electric field, um, E star of R. It, this thing with the vortex, OK. I'm talking about scalar waves for the moment. It doesn't matter, actually. Um, and the idea is this. You want to calc to see if this heuristic notion is right, you calculate the momentum distribution of the atom after it's made a transition. That's a proper quantum mechanical way uh, up to the excited state, after it's absorbed a photon, if you like. Now, this atom has a motional wave function. It's, it's not, uh, we're considering the momentum and position uh, these are quantum mechanical ob quantities. So let the wave function be a Gaussian. It doesn't have to be a Gaussian. I'll tell you in a minute. But let, let it be. Centered on the x-axis at a distant x0 from the vortex with um, some width sigma. There it is. Nice Gaussian. And uh, so the initial state of the atom is, in position representation, it's the initial wave function, direct product with the, um, with the ground state. Then you apply this Hamiltonian, you do standard Dirac perturbation theory to get the state at time t. 
from which you can work out the, uh, the, the, the uh, probability distribution for the atom that's made a transition. The motional state is some state psi. It turns out to be very simple. It's proportional to the initial state, just multiplied by the uh, strength of the field where it is. Now let that be a vortex of order m. So here's the field, x plus i, y to the m, so e to the i, k, z. The z doesn't really matter. It'll give a push in the z direction, which you could cancel by having a wave going the other way. Now the local momentum, as I've said, it is, it's k0 upwards, that's the plane wave bit, but then it's this local vortex structure, which is azimuthal, right. And uh, the atom state is, well, here it is, I've just put in this formula for the optical field, there it is. And the momentum representation is the Fourier transform of that. You can work that out exactly, actually. It's the derivative with respect to kx, i times the derivative to ky to the m, times the Fourier transform of the initial state, with kz minus k0. Of course, you've absorbed the photon going upwards. So that's what it is. Now, th there's something interesting there, because this is a redistribution of momenta that the atom already had, but maybe only in its tail. OK. Now, you can work out the, the strength of that. And you can uh, um, just taking the modulus squared. And uh, you can plot it out, this distribution. Now, what we're thinking, you see, the atom is off to the side, so the kick would be in the y direction. So expect the momentum distribution to be shifted in the y direction. And I've just shown you a few pictures here that it really is. Uh, the, um, I, I, I've, here's a case where the, the width is about the same as the distance. It overlaps the distance. And the m equals 1, and, and uh, m equals 2. Now it's 2 sigma away, you get more of a kick in the y direction. You'd start out with a perfect Gaussian at the origin, and here is it's five times away, and you've got m equals, all kinds of things you can do. And in particular, you can calculate the expectation value of the momentum. Uh, no, no, before doing that, look along the symmetry line. Beforehand, you've got these Gaussians centered on zero, and afterwards you've got these shifted Gaussians, um, uh, uh, which show the effect of the kick. But the actual kick is the expectation value of the momentum, uh, the mean momentum. And of course, there's a part along the z-act. That's, that's irrelevant. But then there's this other part. And this other part, you can calculate it exactly in terms of Laguerre um, polynomials. And uh, you ask, what is it like when the width of the atom is small compared to its distance from the uh, vortex? The answer is exactly the uh, super kick that we expected, exactly the local strength of the local k vector. You can calculate these exactly in, you know, they all tend to this uh, local super kick when the width of the atom uh, wave function is small compared to its distance. If the width is large, it goes to zero because then you overlap the other side, you get a kick in the other direction. Let's generalize this. An atom in any initial state with any real wave function concentrating in a region call it R0, small compared to the spatial variations in an optical field. And here's the optical field. I'm sorry I shouldn't use the same notation psi. Never mind. Then the mean momentum you can just show in that case if the variation of the, uh, if the atom wave function is localized with respect to the variations of the optical field, it always is the local wave vector. So this is a prediction. I would like somebody to do the experiment. Um, what you would need to do would be to have an um, a atom held in a trap and in, by static forces. And in that trap, you would have uh, an optical field or a microwave field which has a phase singularity in it. And you could move the atom around. And the idea is that you would see under suitable circumstances some kind of Brownian mode. The atom would be kicked uh, much by kicks much larger than the momenta, as I said, in any of the uh, plane waves making up that microwave or optical field. Now, these super kicks are very rare. And that rareness, of course, is what, in Yakir's scheme, is the weakness of a weak measurement. And we'll get to all of that in, in due course. I want to finish by uh, telling you another wonderful application of vortices which I recently learned about. I heard Stefan Hell 
He got the Nobel Prize a, a, a year ago for, for um, uh, one of the types of super resolution microscopy, seeing small things smaller than the wavelength, called STED, Stimulated Emission Depletion Microscopy. And I had a very interesting interaction with him after I heard his lecture. It was in Rome a few uh, months ago. Um, I want to remark that in the course of these days, I'm going to show you two other kinds of sub-wavelength microscopy, which also have connections of different types with super oscillations and weak measurements. So without realizing it, people have been using these concepts for a while. But let's talk about this one, because it's something where I, I had a disagreement with Stefan Heller, and I think I convinced him at the end, something he said. So here you've got a plane with some objects in that you want to see. And they're tagged, so they fluoresce when you shine light on. And this is what you do. You shine light on, and this red thing is the main beam that lights up the atom. And of course, it's diffraction limited. You can't focus it down to scales smaller than a wavelength. Um, that's the illuminating beam. If that's all you had, you'd see a blurred out region. But the clever thing is that uh, he has another beam of a slightly different frequency, but that beam has a phase vortex in the middle, which is extremely narrow, and this suppresses the fluorescence because it makes those photons at the atoms decay into states which you don't measure. Um, it suppresses the fluorescence, except in this region where the atom is a, uh, the, 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 the things you're looking at, which have been tagged, are allowed to fluoresce. So that's the depletion beam, suppressing photons outside a small region. Now, when Stefan Hell talked about this, he emphasized, rightly, that this technique involved considering the quantum mechanics of the molecules that you're looking at, the fluorescence and the responses to the different beams. But what he didn't emphasize is that the reason this can work with a depletion beam is that as I've been illustrating to you today, there's nothing in classical optics or classical wave theory or the uncertainty principle that prevents a dark region from being as narrow as possible. You see bright things satisfy the uncertainty principle, the diff uh, diffraction limit, the Rayleigh resolution, the Abbe criterion of microscopy, but there's nothing that prevents um, uh, in classical optics this, um, these dark darkness uh, uh, being diffraction limited. It, it, nothing that says that darkness is diffraction limited. And uh, it took a while to convince him, and I hope I did, that, I mean, although he uses the technique, that it depends on this property of classical waves that darkness doesn't obey the diffraction limit, only brightness does. So that's the kind of point, central point. So this is an application of optical vortices. Um, of the essential property of them, that they can super oscillate uh, or have fine, this fine structure. I, I found a few nice pictures which I'll finish with today. This is the, um, the beam, the exciting beam that he shines on things. This is the donut, the depletion beam with this black region in the middle. And so what's allowed through the remaining fluorescent spot which is not depleted is this very much smaller region. And, uh, you know, he has conventional confocal microscopy of something, I don't actually know what it is, but when you look, use STED, you can see all kinds of fine structure and details that you no way can see using conventional microscopy. Here's the conventional image of a filamentous actin network. Here's the STED image, it has much more detail. But what happens, you scan, you scan that dark, that whole structure across the object, of course, repeatedly. It takes a long time. Here's uh, the Golgi complex in, uh, in, in uh, in, uh, uh, in neuroscience, and uh, here's a plasma membrane. And I've got another picture here, it's a three-dimensional picture. I don't know what this is of, but a confocal image gives you something blurred. You can look at this three-dimensional intensity pattern, but when you look at it with stead, you see all kinds of fine structure. So uh, it's a very beautiful, very clever thing. It's one of a number of little portfolio of techniques now exist, and I'll tell you about uh, several more as these talks proceed, but this makes essential use of optical vortices. So I think I'll stop there today, and uh, if anybody, well, we, ha we can have some discussion, okay?
Sub wavelengths. Yeah. Oh, a tenth or a twentieth with some of these techniques. A tenth or a twentieth. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what you say, just. I mean, for a theorist, we'd like to a million times more. But of course. So you don't think there is any principle that will get us to any? There is, and I'll talk about it in the last lecture. I'm pessimistic, actually, about going much further. But this is amazing anyway to practical microscopy to do the to get. 50 nanometers with 500 nanometer wavelength light. Do you think the same can be used for electron? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's no, there's no. I mean, these are wavy things. You know, you can. Yeah. Well, you have to have the for this technique. You need to have the analog of the fluorescence of the depletion beam. That's an optical thing, but probably there probably is. Yeah. I mean, uh, you see, the point is, electron microscopes were invented to go below the wavelength of light, because the wavelength of electrons is much smaller. But electrons are, have a lot of momentum, and they can destroy things, and you need to be in a vacuum, and so on. And with these techniques, you don't destroy them. It's largely non-destructive. So there's a very big advance. Yes? You just mentioned that uh, electrons have a lot of momentum, because their wavelength is so small. Yeah. Do you get a problem with increasing momentum of the light because you're shrinking the wa effective wavelength down so small? Are you going to run into the similar issues with destroying what you're trying to look at? Well, of course, giving it a large kick is the kind of destroying. I mean, it depends what if this is. I mean, this is not microscopy. What I talked about before. It's actually seeing a quantum effect, which is a kick, which, of course, if it was an object, it probably would destroy it, but uh, no, I, I don't see any limit. Uh, don't, you know, see, it's, it is interesting. The closer you are to the vortex, the larger the kick, provided the wave function of a atom is sufficiently concentrated. Now, of course, that means its momentum has a large spread, but still, as I showed you with my pictures, the shift in momentum is distinguishable. It needn't be it, it need be it, it's small compared to the momentum width, so it's a phenomenon that could be, see, could be seen. Before we did this quantum calculation, people said to me, ah, but you need to localize the atom and they'll have a large momentum, you won't be able to see this kick. But you will. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you couldn't know that too. we did the calculation. Yeah. But, uh, as I said, like all of these super weak or weak things, um, these are rare events. You have to select out, to wait a long time for this to happen. But that's okay. That's part of the story. Yeah. Thank you. Good. So tomorrow I'm going to look at uh, analytic aspects of this weak measurement story, of the shift of the shift of uh, uh, shift of pointers and all that stuff. So that's tomorrow, and then there'll be one um, another experimental technique at the end which involves those ideas. That's tomorrow.